Hello and welcome to the University of Aberdeen's Wayward Festival. Uh, my name is Nadia Kiwan. I'm Professor of French and Francophone Studies at the University of Aberdeen and I'm really delighted to be able to introduce uh, Monica Ali. Um, so welcome to Wayward, Monica. Thank you. Um, Monica Ali is a, is a best-selling writer whose work uh, has been translated into 26 languages and she's the author of five books, um, Brick Lane, Alentejo Blue, In the Kitchen, Untold Story and Love Marriage. Uh, Monica is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and in 2003 was named as um, one of Granta's best of young British novelists. She's been nominated for, uh, amongst others, the Booker Prize, the George Orwell Prize, the Commonwealth Writers Prize, and in the US has been a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Monica Ali has taught creative writing at Columbia University in New York, and um, from 2015 to 2018, she was also distinguished writer in residence at the University of Surrey. So um, today we're going to be talking about your latest novel, um, which I very much enjoyed, Love Marriage. Um, the sharp social observations um, had me laughing out loud and the sort of- the, oh, Good. The, yeah, and the, the <laughs> characterization and the relation, the description of the relationships were also deeply, you know, moving. So um, we're going to, for those people who haven't read the book yet, we'll, we'll start off with a with a short reading from the from the beginning of the, the novel. So I'll hand over to you for that, um, Annika. Okay, thanks, Nadia. Um, and thanks for the introduction. It was like my life was flashing before my eyes as you were reminding me of all that. Uh, Okay, so I'm just going to read from page one, so I don't need to set anything up. In the Garami household, sex was never mentioned. If the television was on and a kissing with tongue scene threatened the chaste and cardamom scented home, it was swiftly terminated by a flick of the black box. When Yasmin began her first period, her mother had slipped her a pack of Kotex maxi pads and murmured instructions not to touch the Quran. This was confusing because Yasmin never touched the Quran anyway, except at the behest of her mother. But it also made sense because menstruation, as she had learned in a biology class, was linked to reproduction. And the dotted line diagrams in the textbook were surprisingly yet undeniably linked to the actors who pushed their tongues into each other's mouths, thus ruining everyone's viewing pleasure. Now, at the age of 26, Yasmin knew all about sex. The human body had long since yielded its mysteries. She had slept with three men and was engaged to be married to the third, Joe, a fellow doctor at St Barnabas Hospital. Her parents, Shokat and Anitha, liked Joe because as a doctor, he was automatically suitable. And because everyone liked Joe, he was gifted that way. If Anissa longed for her daughter to marry a good Muslim boy, it was an opinion she kept to herself. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, if we could uh, maybe start off uh, with a question about what inspired you to write the, the novel uh, Love and Marriage and, and how, how do you see it as relating to your previous work? Uh, oh God, that's a hard question. How do I see it related to my previous work? Okay, well, look, I will um, do a little um, intro to the book for people who haven't read it. So, it tells the story of Yasmin, who we've just met in the first page there, who's 26, she's engaged to be married to Joe, and everything is hunky-dory. Uh, and then he goes and does the unthinkable. I mean, you know, he's sort of perfect in every way. He's a fellow doctor, as it mentioned. He's handsome, he's charming, he's also rich, and he's caring and sensitive and everything else you could possibly want but then he goes and does the unthinkable and he cheats on Yasmin. Um, Yasmin is 
beside herself and distraught but then she goes and does something that shocks her self even more which is she engages in revenge sex and it all kind of spirals out of control from there so at the beginning of the book life was pretty sorted and then everything kind of implodes and explodes all at the same time now how what was the inspiration for the book well i was actually writing two separate stories and one of them was about Yasmin and the other was about Harriet Sangster who in this novel is Joe's mother. Now Harriet is a um, North London liberal lovey famous feminist writer and academic um, and it, I wasn't sure that either of those stories was going to be the one that I would end up writing as a novel. But then I had this sort of light bulb moment, which is kind of rare in writing because it's 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. But this was amongst the 1%. I thought, what if I put them together? And as soon as I had that thought, I knew it was going to be a, an awful lot of fun to write. And I knew it was the book that I had to write. So that was kind of where the story originated. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, thanks. Um, I think that's very useful as well for audiences, um, you know, who haven't yet read read the book to have that that helpful introduction. Um, and you know, it, in in some ways, the the narrative focuses on those systemic issues such as you know racism, Islamophobia, sexism. Yet, in many ways, uh, the novel's grounded and inspired by these sort of individual. Uh, struggles, the internal family dynamics, notably between Joe and his mother Harriet Sangster, as well as between Yasmin and uh, her father Baba or Shaukat. Um, and I wondered if, um, you know, as a writer, do you find it challenging to interweave those systemic kind of political issues with the sort of very personal relation ba relationship based narratives? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I mean, I see entirely where you're coming from, but you know, I don't sit down to write about issues. Those come out of who the characters are. So in that way, um, it feels natural to me. Uh -huh. So uh, if issues around um, race come up, uh -huh. To my mind, of course they do, because Yasmin is of Indian descent. I mean, she's born and bred in London, but she's of Indian descent. Uh, she works in a big London hospital. Um, how is race never, ever going to rear its head? Doesn't mean that it's the mm. dominant thing in her life. It certainly isn't, mm -hmm. but it's, it's going to come up. It would be weird. I would have to make a conscious decision to exclude it. You know, mm. that would be difficult. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's could be done, I'm sure, but that would be a tricky process for me. But um, I mean, the, the 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 overarching thing that drives the narrative. I mean, you sort of picked out a number of, uh, of things there, but to my mind, the overarching thing that on which everything hangs in a narrative sense is sex. In fact, so. That's in terms of major plot points. They nearly all hinge on sex. So whether that's um, infidelity or revenge sex or sex addiction or um, issues around sexual violence or sexual preference. Um, it's also how the protagonist, Joe and Yasmin, grapple with their identities or mature into those identities. And it's... Um, it's the thing that um, drives the conflict and the drama in the book, whether that's within families or um, external to, to families. And of course, you know, that's that's quite easy to do with issues around sex, right? Uh, I mean, it naturally lends itself to that. So, uh, you know, the book is um, constantly looking at issues around shame and guilt um and lies and secrets and also kind of the converse you know uh 
people exploring their freedoms, pushing boundaries, um, play, enjoyment, you know, all of those things. So um, that to me is, it, it, it is the sort of narrative glue, if you like. And then everything else kind of fell into place around that. Does that does that make any sense? Absolutely. Of yeah. Yeah. Because I mean I think Love Marriage to my mind is also it's it's a it's a novel about um emotional literacy, right? And um, mm. you know, we, we see Yasmin move from the state of well, I guess almost kind of emotional as well as sort of political kind of sedation, right? Um, she mm. doesn't ever really want to voice her opinion or she doesn't want to see certain mm. things in the workplace uh, mm. in the fa within the, her own family um, to somebody who becomes really angry but in a positive mm. way you know is able to mm. kind of access that anger whether that's at work or whether it's in her relationships and starts to actually it sounds cliched but but it's you know find her voice you know um, and, mm. um, and we see Joe as well you know, allowing himself to access his rage, right, with regard yeah. to his mother and 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 um, the ways in which you know the boundaries were transgressed there. I won't go into too more much detail for you know for, for readers who've not read it, but you know, I, I found that really really powerful and interesting in the in the narrative. And I wondered also if you could talk a bit about that, but um, the re the research you had to do. I imagine you had to do a lot of research, uh, medical yeah. research to you know find out about what it's like to be you know a junior doctor but also the the research into psychotherapy um and yeah. and that journey that joe you know under, undertakes as well so um yeah that, i wondered if you could comment on those two things um, yeah on the research um yeah i mean i love doing research it's mm -hmm. um you know it's easier than writing <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's one reason mm -hmm. it sort of it puts off that evil day where it's just you and the the blank screen or the blank page but i really enjoy doing research and the challenge with research is always um not to let it overwhelm the book so you know you do your research you immerse yourself in it and then you put it away so for, for me uh, doing the research is sort of giving myself the courage to make things up now that there's a medical side to the book because of the hospital setting and there's again without giving too many things away there was a you know there, there was a minor plot around um a, a medical drama and you have to get facts right mm -hmm. you know so it's important to do the research and i was lucky enough um that i've got some doctor friends who did the the fact checking and that was okay i still get um emails from um the subscription department of the New England Journal of Medicine saying, come back and resubscribe. And I'm like, no, I've done that. I don't need to read any more medical journals. So yes, there, there is that sort of, um, you know, doing the grunt work of finding out, but I enjoy that. Um, the, the psychotherapy, again, as with the medical stuff, I did a lot of reading, um, interviewed um therapist friends as well but i've also been in therapy for a number of years myself and part of the um so the, 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 the again for people who haven't read it there's a character called sandor who is a th who's joe's therapist and there are certain chapters that are devoted to um just the two of them in the consulting room and part of that came out of um me just sometimes think because I wrote those um, chapters from Sandor's perspective rather than from Joe's perspective and I had sat in in the other chair in the consulting room and often wondered well what's going through my therapist's mind because I mean she's she's a she's a really good therapist but of course therapists are people too and sometimes they must be thinking about what are they going to have for lunch or the argument that they had with their husband or, you know, whatever it is. So part of it came out of a curiosity about that. Um, and then I did a lot of research around sex addiction. Um, so there was one particular um, writer who influenced me a lot about the nature of addiction. He's called Gabor Mate and um, you know, he sort of radically changed my understanding of what addiction is and where it comes from. Um, and then I did some special research on the nature of Joe's particular um, 
backstory with his mother Harriet, which you know I don't want to do too many spoilers, but yes, that mm -hmm. was that was also uh, um, something I had to research extensively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you. And, and and I following on from that, I wondered if you could comment on the on the the choices in the you know the uh, the fields of medicine that Yasmin and Joe are in. So. Yasmin's in geriatrics, well, she's at the moment, certainly for the most of the narrative, mm. and Joe is in obstetrics. Um, and I wondered, you know, is there any significance, deeper significance in those choices um, regarding the characters and their own struggles, their own kind of em emotional ooh, ooh, development? Ooh, what's, um, your, what's your reading of that? Okay, Are so my reading, my it? kind of, yeah. my, you know, as a lay, psycho yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of analyst yeah, on, well I just me. wondered if you know Yasmin is slightly uh, certainly the in the early parts of the novel or maybe in most of the novel all her life she's been kind of in the shadow of her father very much you know the father figure has sort of inspired her to do meds in some at some point she thinks it's she did it because she didn't really she wanted to please him I mean in the end she realized mm -hmm. no she's mm -hmm. actually a good doctor mm -hmm. but there's this sense mm -hmm. of that she kind of is um the uh, that she's a good girl right at yeah. home and in the workplace and i just thought it, it, you know is is there something there in the fact that she's chosen to specialize in geriatrics it, it, about her re reflecting the relationship with the father that was just you know i, I don't know that yeah. may be co i may be completely wrong but do you see where i'm coming from a bit in that sense of i do of, uh, i do yeah yeah and then with joe obstetrics gynecology and obstetrics well we know about his sex addiction we know, we know about you know some of his uh, his own kind of emotional reactions after delivering babies and things like that. And um, and I just wondered if there was also another, on a subconscious level, um, you know, I'm not an expert yeah. in this clearly, there was some deeper significance there that you had thought about as you as you as you wrote the the, the narrative yeah and, you know. no, no, no i mean those th things all occur to me i mean you know it's sort of a mysterious process isn't it making those creative choices and we don't mm -hmm. always know why we why and how we make them but i think there's something mm -hmm. in, in in that for for both those things that you've just outlined mm -hmm. i think additionally um with Jasmine and the geriatrics department. I mean, I was writing pre-COVID. I finished during the first lockdown, but I started writing in 2016. But mm -hmm. even then, geriatrics was the kind of, you know, Cinderella department, if you, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the gaps in social care, um, people getting stuck in hospital, being nastily referred to as yeah. bed blockers, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and just the sort of, um, you know, pinpointing how the NHS was really creaking at the seams and underfunded mm -hmm. and all these issues, it sort of made sense to me. Uh, and also in terms of, I mean, Yasmin's value as a doctor is not just that she's good at diagnosing, she is also someone who's compassionate and tries to take the time mm -hmm. to really listen to her patients and care for them in an emotional way and i i felt mm -hmm. that again those opportunities were afforded in the care of the elderly departments mm -hmm. I, and her father's a gp i think at some point Sh showcat says you know between us we're like cradle to grave and joe is mm -hmm. the birth yeah. and i'm yeah. in the middle and you know and yeah. that's something that appeals to him so maybe there was a bit of that mm -hmm. i don't really mm -hmm. I, I don't really know honestly but um you, you sort of do these things and then you retrofit reasons yeah you don't know yeah. what 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 was driving your, your your choice really at the time it just felt sure. right mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. okay and, and if it's okay i've got a question about um a couple of other characters here um so this is the character of rania who is um yes yasmin's um one of her oldest friends, school friend right um uh, and then i'm also going to mention the the um, anisa the mother yes means uh, mother so i my reading again of the, the novel is that the, the character of rania who's a who's a lawyer um she kind of seems to embody a very kind of confident gutsy muslim feminism even if she doesn't necessarily use that term herself um and then you have the character of mao anisa who could also be regarded as a, as a another possible configuration of a muslim feminist again she doesn't use the term you know but she's steadfast in her faith you know she refers to the quran to, you know um yet she's somebody who's highly autonomous as well um mm. and you know arguably 
before her meeting with Harriet Sangster and Flame, um, who could be regarded as a, you know, your sort of secular white middle class feminist. So I, I just wanted, you know, the broad question is, what do you think are the main challenges for British women uh, today? What are the main challenges they face? And do you think that the tensions, perhaps divisions is too strong a word, between a faith-based feminism and a more sort of secular feminism are surmountable? Um, so I don't know if that was, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, there, there's a lot to unpack there isn't there mm. um i mean anisha is a, a lot of readers favorite character just start by saying mm. that i mean a lot mm -hmm. of people really really sort of fall for her if you like mm. um i mean with 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 her you know yasmin doesn't really see her mother you know doesn't actually see her in yeah. her full sense mm. as a as a an actual person she's just ma mm. and the, she, Yasmin loves her, but she's Ma in the kitchen and she's cooking and she's starting mad DIY projects that never get finished. And um, she's taking around curries to all the neighbors. And she's, you know, she does not really considered as the full, the fully remarkable person that she is. And it's actually only through Harriet's friendship with Ma, of which Yasmin is really suspicious, at least initially, that Yasmin really gets her eyes opened through that process, because she can't imagine why Harriet would be friends with Ma. She thinks, well, it's she's going to treat her like a pet, um, it's like a, something that she's collecting in her um, museum of exotic artifacts uh, and that's really because Yasmin hasn't seen Martha who she is and Yasmin I mean a lot of this book is also about assumptions that we make about each other so Yasmin quite rightly resents it when other people make assumptions about her based on her ethnicity or her gender or whatever but Yasmin makes assumptions left right and center including about her own mother and including about Harriet. So I think, um, you know, I think that's what really interests me in those questions that you're posing around both Rania and Anissa and actually all of the characters. You know, we tend to put labels, oh, Rania's this and Harriet's that. Well, I mean, we can't, we can't operate in life without making assumptions on a daily basis. I mean, we don't want to check every time we open the door if the sky is still there and the ground is still there. I mean, I understand that. On the other hand, sometimes it's a good idea to just pause and check our assumptions a little bit. And I think that's what I'm always driving at with, you know, not only in this book, actually, in, in all of my work, do we really know that Rania is this and that Anissa is that? Well, we don't actually until we get to know them fully. And I think that's the journey that Yasmin is on. And you say that you said earlier, quite, you know, quite rightly, she does she does find her voice and she does get a bit cross about certain things and she does act. But this isn't really a book about getting angry. I mean, it's um lots of lots of difficult things happen in the course of the narrative and I mean I don't want to give away things about the ending but I would say at the end it's it's an optimistic book it's a hopeful ending um, and I don't think that reveals anything about what actually happened but I think that's you know my fundamental attitude in life and I think that's what I'm hoping that will come through to readers mm -hmm. as well Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the thing about making assumptions, yes, there's that passage somewhere in the in the novel where Yasmin sort of says to herself, I got everything wrong. Like all my assumptions were wrong. I was wrong about this. I was wrong about that. So yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so um, I wanted to talk, you talked about labelling there. I'm going to just move on to the, that, that um, issue in a slightly different um, frame, not just specific 
to the novel, but, you know, in, in the novel, um, I think it's at one of Harriet Sangster's sort of parties or there's an award party um, for uh, well-known writers or people who are on television. Um, and there are several references in the novel, I think, um, to the problematic labelling that um, writers of colour um, can experience within the publishing industry. Um, do you think that's something which has evolved significantly, you know, over the last 20 years or so, um, for better or for worse? But, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, over the last 20 years, um, I don't know, I mean, I'd have to sort of sit down and really yeah. do some research and, and um, analysis to answer that properly. But off the top of my head, I think things have changed certainly in the last couple of years but I think there's been a big shift at least in lip service post BLM I think that had a massive impact um, uh, including commissioning editors going out and signing up lots of um, writers of colour he, he, he might not have got published before um, that's also a commercial decision you have to remember because there was clearly a market at the time around BLM, subsequently, there was an appetite for, for those books. So it wasn't, you know, all hearts and flowers and being deeply moral. It was also a commercial decision. I, th I think fads come and go in publishing, you know, that's always happened. So I'm I'm hopeful, but right, I remain a little bit sceptical because I think the change that has to come is structural and it has to come within publishing houses. They've got to become more diverse um, and at senior levels. And that is starting to happen, but it's, you know, that's going to take some time. So I don't know. What, what's your opinion? Oh, um... Again, this is not something I specifically am, you know, done done research on. But uh, I guess um, the, the the passage I think in the novel I'm thinking of is where somebody um, there's a writer of color who wants to write in science fiction and who's sort of told by somebody else, well, you know, this is not really what you should be writing about. This is why you're not being published. You know, you write about something more authentic, like and and, mm. and, and it's sort of. I mean, um unsaid but the, the the message i took from that was that, that you know that this person was being uh, sort of uh, hmm. in, in, interpolated to talking about issues around race and, and identity and things yeah. like that and they may not necessarily yeah. want to do that right um so yeah. this is uh well that i, that know, I can how, I how can, free I can... how free is yeah how free are yeah. creators to really do what they want to do yeah. you know yeah. uh, that's well, i think um yeah and it's not just for writing it, it's, it's for music film you know, all sorts of cultural of uh, production uh, and, and academic uh, you know uh, and endeavors as production. well yes yeah yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. i mean there, there, there was a survey done and i think it was 2016 there were, and it was a report called writing in color and it it, it was um, about writers of colour who either hadn't been published yet or had been published in their experience um, mm -hmm. trying to get agents, trying to get publishers. And that was the message from that report, mm -hmm. you know, that, mm -hmm. that that kind of conversation was happening all the time, that kind of experience was happening all the time. Whether that's the same in 2022, I don't know. We'll have to wait for another report to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and um, you, yeah, so you say you started writing the, the, the novel in 2016 and you mentioned there was a report which came out in 2016. Um, and so 2016, a uh, year of the Brexit referendum, I think you mentioned yeah. it gets mentioned in passing. In, 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 in the, person, yeah, yeah I, I just wondered if, you know, um, what was this, you know, why did you choose to set it then? Was was it? Did you feel that was a particular moment which was relevant for the story you wanted to tell, or, or, or is, is it sort of coincidental? Um. I mean, I think it's as simple as I was. I started writing it then. I don't. I don't think it was okay. any okay. more. 
complicated okay. than that. Uh, um, you know, and there was also um, a heightened sense of, you know, division in the country and debates around the position of Britain and whether it was a welcoming place for immigrants or not. So, so, you know, a little bit of that feeds through, but I would say it's quite tangential in the novel. Mm -hmm. It's not the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, and then, yeah, so, I mean, as I mean, you, you're, you're saying that the heart of it is really about the, the um, about love, marriage, sex, family dynamics, um, and the other stuff just sort of come, come, you know, it comes into it because of the people, you know, because of who the characters are. One of the things which we haven't spoken about, I mean, this is a London based narrative and you talk about the North London lovey that, that Harriet is sort of, you know, is, but there are issues around social class in there. Um, and I just wondered, you know, mm. if, if you could talk a little bit about how you think the narrative explores issues around social class and division and, and, and some of the snobbery that we see, not just only in, in, in the sort of uh, the literary establishment, but with, with, you know, within um, Yasmin's own family as well, particularly yeah. Baba. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I would say that Yasmin's family is sort of solid middle class because her father's a GP, she's, she's a doctor, they live in a nice suburb of South East London somewhere. Um, but at the opening of the book, she is going to introduce her family, her parents, to Joe's mother for the very first time. So they're going to be travelling to Primrose Hill. Uh, and Harriet lives in a, a very nice sort of um, Regency townhouse in, in a very she-she suburb of London. And she's, she, I, well, she's also middle class, but she's upper middle class, like she's properly posh and she's moneyed. So there's a class anxiety there. Well, there's all sorts of anxieties, aren't there? When Yasmin is um, about to uh, embark on this journey with her parents, she's she's worried about the cultural differences. Is Harriet going to embarrass her parents by talking about things like the cultural significance of pubic hair, which is one of her pet topics? You know, will her parents be horrified? Will Harriet... Um, uh, just sort of you know kind of look down on her parents or embrace them and in fact how it embraces them but there's a there's a class anxiety definitely present when Yasmin is contemplating her parents going to this posh bit of London and meeting Harriet who is you know in class terms a cut or two above um but later, I mean, one character we've not really mentioned is Arif, her younger mm. brother, who's sort of the black sheep of the family, isn't he? So he's unemployed. He's done a degree in sociology, which according to Baba is, you know, no use to any mankind in any way, shape or form. Um, and Arif sort of doesn't prove him right, but to Baba's mind proves him right by being unemployed. Uh, and then he gets his girlfriend pregnant and his girlfriend Lucy um, comes from a very ordinary, I'd say, working class family. And Yasmin is at some points enraged by Baba's attitude to Lucy's family because he's like, well, this girl has ruined him and, you know, he's lost, Arif has lost. And she contrasts that with Harriet's, because Harriet is, you know, good friends with Ma, and so Harriet gets involved with Lucy's family. And Yasmin contrasts Baba's attitude to Harriet's attitude, which is incredibly relaxed. And then she starts wondering, well, is this another kind of class anxiety that that Baba has? Because if he's climbed, he's climbed up the ladder from very poor background, very humble beginnings in Calcutta. And 
maybe he's feeling so insecure on the on the rungs of the ladder that you know he's desperate for his family not to sort of fall back down so there's all sorts of class issues i think running yeah. through the book in the hospital as well i'd say with the hcas and so on you know the sort of hospital hierarchy because it's a very yeah. hierarchical setting class obviously comes into that in, uh -huh. in certain ways as well um yeah does that sort of mm. yeah yeah that, that that's really very interesting um uh yeah that, that possibly Barbara's reticence about Lucy it, 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 it's not because this is you know there's a baby out of wedlock it's not a sort of religious or moral objection it, it's right. possibly much more related to this idea of class anxiety and, and sort of being displaced in mm -hmm. terms of class suddenly you know because of his mm -hmm. his own trajectory right from very humble beginnings um so yeah that, that's very interesting um I, I just wanted to pick up on one thing that you said and then probably we'll, we'll start to kind of wrap up um it's yeah. um, you know the the, the the anxiety that Yasmin has when her parents go to meet um, Harriet Sangster for the first time is a class anxiety. Um, there's also a kind of cultural anxiety as well. Um, you know, uh, and, and she's worried Harriet that Harriet would, just be, Harriet would just be a lot for any family, right? Yeah, she's quite overbearing. Yeah. She's quite out yeah. there, and so you know, it, whatever Yasmin's background. It would be mm -hmm. quite a. Um, it, it would be something that would cause you some nerves, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and 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 you you said something that about you know Yasmin was worried that Harriet wouldn't uh, sort of take to I can't remember the words you used wouldn't take to uh, wouldn't embrace uh, yeah, Annie yeah. Ma, but actually she does. Yeah. And I just wondered, if, you know, it's certainly in the early stages, I mean, how you saw it, because would you say that she embraces her for who she is or she has her, how does Harriet have her own assumptions and sort of end up kind of othering Ma and Yasmin by saying, yeah, you need to have Joe jo and Joe and Yasmin need to have a, a, a Muslim ceremony, that, that <laughs> sort of thing, you know, that sort of slightly exoticizing um, yeah. dynamic, yeah. But that's, well, you see, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing is, it's not either or. I mean, mm, yeah. Harriet is, um, she's she's like doing integration by steamroller. <laughs> 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 uh, but to, I mean, a very superficial, and to my mind, it would be a wrong reading of Harriet's to see her as an example of white privilege and nothing more. Uh, but, you know, Harriet actually has a good heart and she has her own issues. I mean, she's aging, she's worrying about her relevance, she's worrying about being lonely. She's a single parent of an only son who's just about to go off and get married. Um, and her motivations towards Ma, I mean, they're mixed. I mean, most of our motivations towards most things and most people are mixed. Um, and she's also got this family history that she doesn't understand until very late on, which is a tremendous burden on her. I mean, that's the other thing I just want to pick up at actually, you know, at the opening of the book, it's like, oh, Yasmin now knows all about sex, but sex is never mentioned in the Garami household. And she, you know, Yasmin does not know all about sex. She's, she's got a lot to learn. And that's part of her journey through this book um but this thing about you know sex never mentioned the garami household and harriet's very open about everything yasmin begins by being kind of envious of the sangsters of joe and his mum that they can talk about everything but they can't because they don't mm. understand everything they can't talk mm. about the really important things because they don't know them they don't understand them and it's 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 um I think I was sort of also wanting to play a bit with this stereotype of South Asian cultures and families closed, therefore more backward in some way, Western cultures and families more open and therefore it's much better. Well, I just wanted to challenge that a little bit because it's not that simple, not that simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so um, we're we're coming to the end of our um, allotted time. So I think I will just we can wrap up there. I just want to finish by saying thank you again very much uh, for being so generous with your answers and your time, uh, Monica. Um, and right. and I'm going to hand over now to the to the audience uh, for for questions. Thank you. So we have um, about ten minutes for. Um, questions from the audience so uh, we can take those questions um, you can pop them into the, either the the q a box or the um the chat so uh, i'll just monitor those i'm just checking right well just maybe while people are kind of gathering their thoughts I'll kick us off if that's all right. Um, so just watching the interview back there, um, Monica, I was struck by something that you were saying about um, this notion of shame. Um, and I guess, yeah, in many ways that the narrative is one which explores the question of shame and it's shame in a way links quite a lot of the characters, I would say maybe probably all of them um and i was wondering if you know you know you could talk about why it was important for you to explore that issue around shame but also the the other side of the coin which anasa talks about as being pride you know in one of her conversations at the end of the novel with with yasmin yeah i mean i've, I've long been wondering about the the link between shame and pride and whether they are inextricably linked I'm, I'm not sure what what I think about that in the end I think there's one version um in which you can see that quite clearly with Baba um you know when the when he's in a rage for instance um which comes from pride it also comes from a place of shame, I think, about his um, beginnings, about the real story behind his marriage and so on. So I think those things can be very intimately linked. Um, I don't know. It's, I just find it fascinating to, territory to explore. And the thing about shame is that it's, um, it, it, it's something that makes us become very private and secretive and this is a book that's also full of secrets uh, because when we, we, we feel shame we want to hide but the, the irony is that the antidote to shame is empathy and we can only seek out empathy when we stop hiding so I think you know all of those things feed into the narrative in, in one way or another does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, and I think Kirsty has just put a, a message to everyone. So just inviting people to, to make comments and uh, put any questions you have. Don't be shy. <laughs> um, I have um, a question about the, the follow up to the novel. I read somewhere that this is being uh, changed into a television series. Is that is that something that you can talk about? Um, I was interested to find out more on that. Well, it was very exciting. There was um, an auction for the television rights before the book was published. And um, there, I think there were about eight or ten, I can't remember, companies bidding. And so that was, um, yeah, that, that was quite exciting. And I, I, um, I went with a company called New Pictures, who are fantastic, who I'm loving working with. And it's in development with the BBC. Um, these things can go rather slowly, <laughs> it turns out. But it's in development with the BBC and I'm writing the scripts and very much enjoying that because it means I get to spend more time with Yasmin and Joe. And actually, although it's been 10 years since my last book came out, I haven't been idle entirely all of that time and some of that time I was trying to write TV drama and 
I had to learn from scratch how to do that. I had to teach myself by reading a lot of scripts, basically, is the way that I went about it. And I worked with a number of different production companies, um, really enjoyed the collaborative aspect of that because writing a novel is very solitary business. And um, I got scripts commissioned, no, nothing ever ended up on screen. Um, but it didn't really matter because I enjoyed it. But now it's really, you know, it's, it feels like that was my training period. <laughs> and now it's come back around and it's coming to fruition with um, turning Love Marriage into a, into a TV series. So, yeah, I'm really happy about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I look forward to it. So when are we likely to be able to see that on our screens? Oh gosh, I don't know. It's early days yet. Come back to me. I'll get I'll give you an update. <laughs> okay. okay, we'll do. Yeah. Um, and um I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the different creative processes involved in script writing and you know, writing novels. I mean, you talked about the solitary aspect of it, but is there is there anything else that you think is you know radically different there? Which, um Yes, yeah. I mean, it, it it is it is radically different. It's not just a question of um, writing dialogue. I mean, obviously there is an element which is writing dialogue, but that but if you start off thinking of it in that way, then it's not going to work. So the biggest challenges really are, are structural. So. Um, you know that but that that's an interesting challenge to have so you know certain things which happen off stage in the book that they need to be actually seen you know presented on on, on screen um certain things that happen or are not disclosed until later need to be brought forward so all of those structural decisions and then the kind of visual grammar the thing so you know has to have some kind of um, internal coherence and integrity so you know how are we, we going to use flashbacks or what are the rules around using flashbacks for instance so all of those things have to be really carefully thought through um, but I mean th th there are there are ways in which the book sort of lends itself to a natural transition because um it's quite episodic I would say the chapters are quite short it's very visual so while it's certainly very a very different exercise um there are some aspects of the book that you know lend itself quite well to tv drama yeah I, I agree I felt that when I was reading it actually I could imagine it yeah uh, on the screen. Um, okay, we have a question uh, in uh, the Q&A from um, Douglas. I'll just read, read that out. Um, do you have a writing regime? Um, do you um, a morning or even evening? You know, how, how does how do you organize your, your schedule? Uh, yeah, um, well, it's much easier now to have a schedule because my kids are grown up. But when I started writing, I had um, a two-year-old and a baby uh, who I was still nursing. So it, writing at that stage was whenever and however, and often in the middle of the night when, <laughs> when, I, when one of the kids would wake me up. So um, then it used to be organized more or less around school time. So I had to be really disciplined in that way and fit my writing time into between school pickups and drop offs. And um, but now my kids are no longer kids. They're 21 and 23. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, their age is right. I think that's it. Um, so I get to organize my own time. And what I find works best for me is actually to get my writing done first thing um because it, as soon as I allow other things to come into my day it throw it throws me off and it's harder to get focused but you know everybody's going to have a different pattern um and I can it, and it depends on the writing day because you know if it's a writing day that's going badly two hours can feel like an eternity but if it's a writing day that I actually managed to 
become submerged in the work, then eight hours can just go like that, you know, and it, the day has just gone and I've barely looked up. So it just depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, when, and if I can just piggyback on that question, because it's really interesting mm. just thinking about the actual kind of mechanics of it. Um, how often do you like reread what you've written or, or when do you do that? Uh, how does that work? Um, would you just sort of write it all and then, and then sort of hand it over to somebody else to read? I mean, yeah. Oh gosh, no, I edit a lot as I go along. Um, so I revisit sentences time and time and time again. Um, I mean, this book was a bit different actually than my previous books and the way that it came out because I knew, so with previous books, I did end up with a fairly tight first draft, I would say, because, um, because of that constant editing process. And this time around, I was going back and back and editing, but I also knew that I was writing too much it was going to be too long um but I somehow couldn't help that and I just felt it had to or just it had to come out and then I had to cut and that was the I, I really really worried about that and I thought this is not my process I'm doing it wrong this is not how it should be but then when I got to the end and started the cutting process it was actually fine and I just learned from that that it's it's not about my process or the process it's it's just what what is what that book requires mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. yeah Okay, um, and I should just say um, to audiences, because we started a little bit late because of the technical issues, we are going to overrun, so um, just by about 10 minutes, so we've got a few more minutes um, if people uh, want to post any further comments or questions. Oh, uh, we could wrap up. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> You want to, you want to wrap up? No, no. I'll just say if there's no other questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I should say that um, you can also you can get hold of Monica's um, other books as well as Love Marriage at the Blackwell's Bookshop, which is on campus on the High Street. And I'm told that between now and I think it's the, the, the end of the month, there's a fifteen percent um, discount as well. So um, if you haven't gone along and uh, bought Love Marriage, then um, here's an invitation to do so. Um, it's, it's, I should say that I very much enjoyed the book. I mean, I don't know, I think I got cut off from the recording, but we did have a little chat at when back in July. And, you know, it was really kind of, it was a book which made me laugh out loud, but it was also deeply moving. So, you know, it, it, you know, I was in tears as well. So, I mean, it was a really, really excellent read. So I hope that, you know, audiences who haven't read it will go along and, and enjoy it as, and read it as, and enjoy it as much as me. Um, in, in the meantime, we have a question from Ruth Taylor um, in the Q&A box. I'll just read that one out as well. I wondered if there is a theme of forgiveness. Uh, Yasmin and Joe's situation, um, self-forgiveness as well. I found their process really interesting. So. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't had that question come up before. So, um, yeah, I guess I guess there is. I mean, I could sort of pick that out, um, not only in terms of Yasmin and Joe, but perhaps also the dynamic between Joe and his mother, um, maybe between Anisha and Showcat as well. In various ways so I, I guess yeah I mean yeah Yasmin and and Joe that certainly comes into their relationship I think it also comes into the um the question of whether the characters can forgive themselves I think, um, you know, for all Yasmin's beating up on herself, in the end, is, is she able to let go of some of those sort of self-flagellations, as it were? So I think, yeah, I think that's that's um, that's interesting. I'm going to ponder on that more, actually. Yeah. 
Um, thanks for that question, uh, Ruth. Um, and then we've just got a comment uh, from uh, Ray, Ray Cowie. Thank you very much uh, for the interview and look, looks forward to reading Love and Marriage. So I, I think if there aren't any other um, comments from people, we, you know, we will begin to sort of wrap that up. And I just, you know, it just remains for me to um, thank you very much, Monica, for your time, for your generous answers. Um, and uh, yeah, for, you know, really thinking about the, the questions. Um, and uh, I also um, would like to thank um, uh, Leslie Carrera, our wonderful BSL interpreter, um, media services, so Martin, John, Richard, um, the Wayward team, of course. So we have uh, Kirsty, Helen, Elisa, and, uh, and B. Uh, and um, yeah. Thank you to Creative Scotland, uh, to the University of Aberdeen for generous funding. Um, yeah, and there's lots of other events going on until Saturday. So um, yeah, look forward to seeing you at some of them. Some of them are online, some of them are in person. So thank you very much. Thanks, Nadia. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs>